That would be great. We'll get started right on time. All right, we are going to get started. So if everybody could take their seats. While people trickle in, I'm going to do some housekeeping announcements. Um, the nearest bathroom is out this door, down the hall and to the left. I want to explain the question, um, how we're going to do questions. So the speakers are not taking any oral questions, um, either during or after the session. So every table has note cards and pencils in front of them. If you have a question that you'd like the speakers to answer at the end of the session, write the question on the note card, put the note card in your hand, and put it above your head. Okay, there are session assistants that are going to come around and take those note cards from you, um, and we will do all of that at the end. So no questions um, without a note card. I think that's about it. Imaging technologists, please, if you're here for CEUs, don't forget to sign the form. And I think that's it. So uh, my name is Megan Cayley. I'm a member of the Issues Committee. Um, I'm also a physical therapist specializing in oncology out at Providence, Milwaukee. Um, so I am, as a, as a employee pro provider for Providence, I'm really excited to be asked to introduce the speakers today. And I want to thank them for coming and taking their time. Okay, did that, perfect. So, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Allison Conlon. Dr. Conlon is a physician and researcher at the Providence Cancer Institute here in Portland. We are so, so lucky to have her here to discuss the latest uh, and greatest in, cr in uh, the clinical trials. She currently has a grant from the American Cancer Society focusing on cancer screening, prevention, and follow-up care for the Oregon Health Study. And thank you for being here. Nikki Moxon, I am also uh, honored to introduce, yay! Um, she is an oncology nurse, also at the Providence Cancer, Cancer Institute. Her current role as a breast cancer clinical trial nurse makes her an incredible asset for this session's topic. She works with patients, families, and physicians to find the best trial options, and then follows them and cares for them while they're going through their trials. And I want to thank them both and introduce them today. Thanks, Megan. It's awesome to have you introduce us here today. Thanks, everybody, for coming in to hear about this. You know, we actually tweaked a little bit about what we're talking about, um, what I noticed in the program. We're not really going to give you a list of the trials available and all the things that are going on. We more want to talk about research and why it's so important. I personally um, have been a, a PI. You'll learn a little bit about that. Uh, for trials for the last 10 years since I've been here in Oregon. So I've been doing research here, but clearly my research um, actually started before that. In my fellowship at Sloan Kettering, I did uh, quite a bit of research, got really exposed to wonderful breast cancer researchers. In fact, even when it comes down to my um, time, even before becoming a doctor, probably my, my original experience with research was when I was actually trying to get into medical school. I couldn't get in for three years. So it was like back when ER was really popular, and so a lot of people wanted to be a doctor. I knew every episode. Um, and so there were three people applying for every one spot. So I couldn't get in my first year. I couldn't get my second year. I decided to go get a master's in public health. Those are my extra little letters there. And I, um, that was an expensive degree at BU, which wasn't going to lead to 
the job I ultimately wanted to get to, so I had to find a little way to pay for it. I worked full-time on a research study with a really inspirational cardiologist at um, the Brigham and Women's uh, Medical Center in Boston, which is Harvard's hospital, and she was researching chest pain and how women present differently to the emergency room when they have um, cardiac events. They don't always get that classic crushing chest pain. Of course, we know this now. This was like in the 1990s, so uh, I mean, I was like a teenager, but um, so she, and I worked as her research assistant, and I coordinated all the nurses' interviews and all the patient interviews. I got to go to the emergency room and collect all the data, and I thought, oh my God, this is so cool. This is how we learn. Um, how many people in the room have ever had a surgery? Any kind, not just breast cancer kind. How many people have ever taken antibiotics? Pretty much everybody. The reason we knew to give you that antibiotic or to do that surgery is because some person volunteered before you for us to figure out that was the right course of action. If we knew how important research was to our everyday survival in life, we would be lined up at the door to volunteer. But unfortunately, in cancer, in adults, only 3% of people go on research trials, maybe as high as 5%. We aim to get 8% at Providence as a, as a goal. Some years we get 15%, but most of the time we're in the single digits. For little kids with cancer, children oncology, it's 60 to 65%. What are they doing right? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. I think they're having the right mindset. And if you look at my question, which says, ask your doctor about clinical trials, that was sort of like a phrase I feel like I've heard a long time ago. Um, my husband asked, well, what, you're making the people decide? This is their problem? No, you got to find the right place and the right care plan where things will be offered to you. Because it turns out the number one deciding factor about going on a clinical trial is what your doctor tells you. It's not what you find on the internet. It's not what your friend did. It's the person you trust the most. So um, we got a lot of things to say today. I want to let Nikki introduce her background and research as well and, and talk a little bit before I close out our program. Thanks, Ellie. Hi, everybody. So again, I'm Nikki Moxon. I am an oncology nurse. I've been an oncology nurse since my senior practicum in nursing school. Luck of the draw, that's where I landed uh, for my senior practicum in patient oncology. And I thought, oh, yeah, OK. These are the people I want to take care of, and these are the people I want to work with. So I went straight out of nursing school into radiation oncology, and I spent five years there. And while I was there, I did some teaching, and I also spent some time helping collect some specimens for some studies. And that's where I started learning about the clinical patient side of oncology care and research. And I thought, that's kind of fun. And after five years, this breast cancer position with Dr. Colin and research at Providence opened up, and I thought, that's where I'd like to go and grow as an oncology nurse. And I've been doing this now for five years and have no plans of ever doing anything else. Uh, this job is fantastic. It means I get to work with doctors directly and spend a ton of time with patients. Um, there's a lot of nursing that feels a lot like kind of walking through one of those rotating doors with patients, especially if you're inpatient. Sometimes it feels like they come in and you see them for a day, maybe three days, and then you might never see them again. You might never get to see their family again. And in this job, I get to meet people and teach them about trial options and consent them to trial options. And then I get to take care of them if they end up going on the study with the doctors and the other nurses and all of the rest of our care team for the whole time that they're on trial. And sometimes that's years. And that means we get to have amazing relationships with our patients and their families and their loved ones and makes it a hugely fulfilling job and also has shown me what a really big role, again, that clinical research can play in quality of life for patients and their families as well. So we'll go forward here. So in this talk, we're going to try to touch on real basically what is a clinical trial or study? Why would I or my loved one want to go on one? How do I go on one, more specifically, of course, and then go over some specific case examples, some great stories that we have of um, patients that we've taken care of. So what's a clinical trial? So the National Institutes of Health defines a clinical trial as a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned, so that means kind of ahead of time, uh, assigned to one or more interventions, which can include a placebo or another control, to evaluate the effects of those interventions on health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. So that's a mouthful. Um, there's a lot of terms 
that you will hear. And very often when you see the title for a study, so if you get on Google and you go to the NIH's clinicaltrials.gov page and you put in breast cancer, you're going to get a list of study titles. Randomized is one of the terms that you're going to hear a lot of, and that means that patients are assigned to a treatment side by the flip of a coin. You don't get to choose. We don't get to choose. Typically, it's a computer program choosing. And so it's not always a flip of a coin, meaning 50-50. Sometimes it's two to one ratio, but that means that you're randomized in a random fashion to the treatment arm. We don't have a say. Um, the arm of a clinical study is referring to what cohort or treatment or intervention that you might get assigned to. So a study that has three arms has three very different or slightly different interventions or treatments that you could do. So this could be drug A, B, and C, and you get randomized to one of those, or it could be an acupuncture study, and you get real acupuncture, or sham acupuncture, or you don't get anything. So arm just means what are the options, okay? Blinded means you don't know what you're getting, and most of the time the doctor and the nurse don't know what you're getting. Um, and in most blinded studies, there's also a placebo, um, meaning that there's a substance or a procedure with no therapeutic effect. So that's kind of our, think of it as the control, especially if we're trying something new. Sometimes we want to compare it to a control and make sure that it really makes a difference. So what types of studies are there? So some examples of interventions to prevent or treat a disease are medical products. So that's what most people think about. You're thinking about a new drug um, that, or a new device or a new procedure. There's also changes to participants' behavior, such as diet or exercise interventions. Can doing yoga during chemotherapy decrease fatigue from chemotherapy? Okay, things like that. Um, we're comparing new ideas versus standard of care medical approaches. So this is standard of care means the stuff that other people helped us prove in the past is effective. Does it make a difference if we do the new thing? And then drug development in phases one through four. So specifically to explain the phases, so phase one, we're really looking at safety of a new treatment or intervention and dosing. So this is going to be most of the time first in human, and we're really looking at, is it okay to give this to people, and at what doses is it safe to give it? Um, we're not always looking at efficacy. We're not looking at how effective it is. We're just trying to see, can we give it, and how high should the dose be? Um, and so NIH says approximately 70% of drugs move on to the next phase of study. And these studies usually take a shorter period of time weeks to months. You move then to phase two if the drug or the treatment intervention advances. And now we've thrown in efficacy. So part of the objectives of the study are now going to include, is this intervention effective? And more study of side effects, because we also enroll lots more people at phase two versus phase one, typically. So we have a larger sample to see what kind of side effects are happening. Again, continued evaluation of safety of a treatment and then gives us a good idea of how well it might work. Approximately only 33% of these drugs move on to the next phase. And these studies take a bit longer than a phase one. We watch them for longer. Part of that effectiveness evaluation means we have to, the studies have to take longer to give us that data. So phase three, these are much larger groups of people so instead of maybe 100 or so people, this is typically thousands. Very often these are global studies. And the goal is really often to compare now that treatment we were testing, that new thing in phase one or two, now we're going to compare it to that standard of care treatment or intervention and see is it better. And then these large studies are also looking for other uncommon side effects. We went from testing the, the treatment in 100 people to thousands more likely that we might learn something new about the side effect profile. And then approximately 25% of this phase of trial of treatment moves on to the next phase, which is really approval. They go to approval, which in our country comes out of the FDA, 
right? So the FDA gives grants at approval, and these studies take years. These are studies if you consent to, you're consenting for us to follow you for typically at least 10 years. The treatment's not necessarily 10 years. It could only be a year or two, but we've got to follow you for 10 years to really see is it safe, is it making a difference? Should we give this to other people? Uh, and then phase four, post-market monitoring. So at this point, they're approved. It's continued monitoring of the drug and the safety and the side effects. And we're watching again for anything unexpected to come out of treatment. And then this again goes on for years after that initial FDA approval. So what types of studies are there? So obviously, most people know there are treatment trials, new drugs, new therapies, new things we're trying. Cancer control trials is not something as many people are familiar with. This is very often maybe giving aspirin after your early treatment for breast cancer to see can we prevent recurrence. It could also be something like that yoga study to prevent or decrease fatigue during chemotherapy or after chemotherapy. So that's the kind of cancer control trial. It's not necessarily a treatment to treat the cancer. It's more around quality of life and symptom management most often. Imaging and surveillance trials. So in breast cancer, lots of studies have been done in the past around mammograms, ultrasounds, currently studies going on with the use of MRI in different breast cancer populations. So that's what we're talking about. What's most effective imaging for what different kinds of breast cancer and at what time point should we be doing them? And then tissue collection biospecimen trials. So this is not a treatment at all. This is you signing up for chemotherapy regimen that is a standard of care treatment and agreeing to essentially kind of donate tissue from a previous biopsy or maybe a future biopsy or surgery and also blood samples that will go to the research institute attached to that study and be used for future research. So it doesn't really impact your care at all, but it can make a big difference in the future for researchers being able to learn what's going on in women like yourself getting specific treatments. And then cancer control delivery research. This is a newer area for us, and it's a kind of study where we've started looking at, uh, a good example would be looking at physicians when do they teach patients about specific topics? How do they do that conversation? And if we change it to maybe a different time point or to a different frequency, does that improve or decrease patient satisfaction or quality of life? So looking at how we deliver our cancer care and our teaching, and if we have a better assessment of how that's done across this country, can we make it better? Can we make it more consistent? Um, and then a registry trial is kind of similar to a tissue collection biospecimen trial in that there's no real impact to you, the participant. You're agreeing to provide data, your data to the study. Say you have HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer and you agree to do a registry trial that allows the trial to just track you through the course of your care and they're just trying to track nationwide or globally what are patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer being treated with? How long are those treatments being effective? How many different treatments are they getting? So again, can we learn from the data that's out there, but not a treatment? So examples of open studies. So this is a good, we pulled this out of our um, numbers from last year just to give you guys an idea of what a common breakdown of a number of enrollments on the different kinds of trials looks like. So as you can see, the, the biggest wedge of the pie here are therapeutic trials. That's treatment trials. Most people that go, go on a clinical study go on one that involves some kind of intervention or treatment. Um, the 6%, the second largest wedge, is cancer control or prevention. And again, those are not necessarily treatment for the cancer, but they're symptom management. And so we get good enrollments for those. And then the other smaller wedges are made up of those registry, observational, and biospecimen collection trials, not the direct uh, intervention trials. So where do we get our ideas for studies? Where do we start? How do we start? So we get a lot of our trials from large cooperative group organizations that are sponsored in the US by 
the National Cancer Institute. So those cooperative groups go by this acronym SOUP, sorry guys, uh, SWOG, Alliance, ECOG, NRG, and what those are is those are different groups of doctors with shared interests in oncology coming together as thought leaders, brainstorming, and coming up with those protocol ideas all across those different kinds of trial types, presenting them, getting them funded and implemented, and then we get to offer them to our patients and participants here in the community. So pharma or pharmaceutical company sponsored trials are another big percentage of trials. And these trials come directly from a specific company that has questions about how their drug or their ideas for their drug fit in with the current care regimens. So this is where we get a new drug and it goes through phase one from a pharmaceutical company and they're most often those phase one trials where we're doing first in human or they have had a drug that they've done phase one trials but they tested it in breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, brain cancer, and liver cancer all on one trial. And out of that trial they took it to a phase two and they narrowed it down to say breast cancer, lung cancer. And from there they said, okay, we saw a really strong signal. This looks really promising. And it was pretty well tolerated by breast cancer patients. We wanna do a phase three. So that's gonna come, a lot of our new treatment trials can come out of those pharmaceutical companies and they're very important. And they also partner with those cooperative groups very often to provide medications to support trial ideas that come out of the cooperative groups at the national level as well. And then we also have investigator-initiated studies. And these are ones that are really excited for me because it means that Dr. Conlon's writing it or Dr. Page or other doctors that I work with directly. These are our docs at a local site, have an idea, have a research focus, and come up with a protocol. And they work with pharmaceutical companies. They work with big, broader groups, get funding from lots of different places because, of course, these are costly. But they're local. This is not a big national thing. This is an effort that is essentially promoted by our local physicians. And so most of the time, those trials are just open at our local sites in Portland. And so those are exciting and can make a big difference too. So who pays for clinical trials? So a lot of the money comes from pharmaceutical companies, especially if it's their trial. Um, but as I said, they can contribute um, medications and funding for other trials investigators, academic and medical centers. So uh, like OHSU will fund their, fund their physician trials, Providence funds trials. So lots of different places help fund. Um, and then of course, federal agencies provide grants and other funding from the National Institutes of Health, Department of Veterans Affairs, National Cancer Institute, and within Oregon, the Oregon Health Authority will even contribute funds. Um, and then there are also grant funding and uh, kind of funds that come from specific charitable groups like Komen will fund certain studies. And then, so clinical research goals. So what are we trying to do with all of this stuff? So we're trying to improve prevention, early diagnosis and treatment of cancer across the board. Uh, we're trying to discover whether a particular drug or medical treatment is safe and effective we're advancing the state of scientific and medical knowledge. We don't want to stand still. And then measure and improve the quality of life for patients and their families. So what we're not doing, promise, cross my heart. We're not trying to try new things on people who don't know any better. We're not trying to take advantage. We are not trying to use patients as guinea pigs. We are definitely never, ever trying to harm anyone. And we are definitely not doing studies to get more funding for other studies. Guarantee that doesn't help. And certainly we don't do this to make money. So who conducts clinical trials and studies? So probably I already guessed, doctors, okay? So who are typically considered investigators if they're helping with a clinical trial? A principal investigator, say Dr. Conlon, um, would be the study lead doctor and they function either locally or nationally or both depending on the protocol. And then we have co-investigators that are doctors working with the patients on the study. So if Dr. Conlon's the PI and it's her study and she's the lead, but you see Dr. Atchison at St. Vincent, she's a co-investigator. 
she can enroll you on that trial of Dr. Conlin's, and she can take care of you on that trial. So that's what we mean by a co-investigator. And then clinical studies also have a really big research team built around every patient and every trial. That includes other doctors, nurses, the social workers, and other healthcare professionals. So at Providence, we also have nurse navigators who are very big help. We have resource specialists, uh, and it's, it's pretty much, you name it, they're involved. Um, and then we also have a large team of research nurses that spend a lot of time with patients on study. As I said, I, I spend time with patients from consent through treatment and follow-up. So where do we do studies? So hospitals, both university-based hospitals and community-based hospitals. Community events can be a place for a study to happen. Say a head and neck, free head and neck screening in the community where when you go in to get screened, you agree to let them collect some of your data and use it at a community level. So mostly in the outpatient clinics. So not a lot of uh, the studies are based like wholly inpatient. Um, they're usually outpatient. So for Providence, that's Providence Portland on the east side, Providence St. Vincent on the west side, our Clackamas southeast location, and then our Newburgh location. Those are all outpatient clinics where we see patients with the doctors, do treatments if it involves treatment in the infusion room. And then not all studies are available everywhere. It's important to remember, and again, like Dr. Conlon said, to be asking, because it takes a lot of work to open, keep open, and monitor a study so that a lot of places are really selective. So sometimes it's Dr. Conlon and I saying, this is feasible here, but it's not feasible at this location way out here. And that has to do with study requirements. And sometimes it's the sponsor of the pharmaceutical company who's having a le letting us open their study, who says, no, you can only have it at your main site. So it really depends on the kind of study, what we're doing, and who's opening it. So who can participate? Who gets to say, I want to do a clinical study? So this is a big part of my job with, with the study doctor, is making sure that the people we put on a clinical trial are truly eligible and fit the population to go on. So eligibility, inclusion, exclusion criteria. So this is what defines who can go on a study and can be very lengthy. I mean like four pages of single space criteria that I have to go through and make sure that a patient meets before they can go on the study. And that includes everything from the kind of breast cancer you have, what were your previous treatments for your breast cancer? Does that fit the criteria? And an exclusion criteria example would be maybe previous heart disease, autoimmune disease, if it's an immune therapy trial. So we have to make sure that you both fit and are safe to enroll on a trial. So the factors such as age and gender, they include that as well, seem pretty basic, but they specify. Type and stage of disease, previous treatment history, other medical conditions, and now how are participants protected? So what do we do to make sure that our people are safe, that when you go on a study, that you're protected? So it starts with an informed consent. And that doesn't mean a five minute conversation with your doctor. That means a long conversation, and it means reviewing, if it's a treatment trial, a informed consent document for the study that is often 20 pages long. So it's not a minor thing, and that's something that you spend very often a lot of time with either the doctor or the research nurse reviewing and making sure that you understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the potential risks and benefits are. Now, every trial also has is overseen by an institutional review board. They make sure we're using correct versions of the protocol, correct drug uh, information. They're called investigational brochures for each medication if it's a medication trial, and then making sure, again, that our consent matches all that other information. There are also monitoring committees of folks who monitor the studies in the data, and then federal agencies, so Office of Human Subjects and Research Protection and the FDA. So there's a lot of oversight to make sure that people are taken care of appropriately when they participate in research. So I'm about to hand this over to Dr. Conlin, and she's going to talk about more specifically how we evaluate people when they're on a study and do some great case examples. I think we should have put like five more slides in how important the research nurses are. <laughs> I know Dave would agree. Um, <clears throat> 
our research nursing team is really critical and they spend an enormous amount of time with patients, um, educating them and helping them understand what they may be signing up for. Truly that idea of informed consent though is about everything we do. I mean, you have an informed consent when you agree to you know, have any kind of treatment, take a pill. You know, if you just are taking a, a vitamin at home, you're having informed consent with yourself. Why am I taking this pill? What is it going to accomplish? What are the possible risks? And uh, you know, what are the possible benefits? So uh, we formalize it all in research because we realize the stakes are higher, but it's, uh, it's out of a process of what we do all the time that this formal process comes. So once a patient is on study, uh, we, we really have to be very methodical about how we uh, evaluate them, how we know what we're doing is working. We think about this before we write a study. When we write a study, we, um, you know, when we make our best guess at what's going to happen, it's based on informed ideas, it's based on a hypothesis, it's based on observations perhaps that we've made or a scientist uh, has published or we have read in the literature. And we write into our trial how much better we think this intervention is going to be, what percentage better, and then we have these really important people called st statisticians. Um, they spend a lot of time understanding the mathematics of how um, you know, a different uh, thing might happen by chance or not, uh, and we decide how many people we would need to see that above and beyond chance. Uh, so in, when we decide how we're going to do the study, we have to have a clinical kind of exam at a specific time point. So a, a classic example is in advanced breast cancer, we would want to perhaps repeat a CT scan or a PET scan to look at how much cancer there is and how has it changed over time. Uh, the standard of care has typically been every three months or 12 weeks. Some studies are up to every six to eight weeks because we are anxious to see a result or we are concerned if we don't see the result, we want to move on. Um, you know, it's, it definitely differs between the study. And even now with the advent of immunotherapy, sometimes we look at 12 weeks, but we really need to confirm something in four weeks because of the different types of uh, uh, responses. We certainly are evaluating labs. I mean, this is just part of our standard of care that we need to follow. How is the body functioning? Or is their kidneys being injured? Are the liver uh, being uh, affected? Should we make sure that we have adequate blood counts? So it's, it's quite often you will see when you're thinking about a study, a document that has a calendar. We like to put it visual if we can that shows you know, at week one and at week two and at week five, you're going to be coming back for labs. And in fact, in some of our earlier phase studies, we do something called PKs, which is pharmacokinetics, which is looking in your blood at certain hourly time points, hour one, hour two, hour four, hour eight, um, to see how much drug level there is. And some uh, research institutions can't perform that kind of level of uh, care because that's a lot of nursing time and uh, logistical time. You have to figure out when there's like an eight-hour drug, uh, eight-hour draw. What time do they start? You know, they have to be here at a certain hour and not be here in the middle of the night. So uh, labs can be very important, but usually a little bit more accessible, obviously, than a CT scan. Of course, there can be other testing like um, heart testing, an EKG, or an echo. If we're concerned that what we're doing might affect other organs, we want to make sure we're also looking at that. Um, and obviously, when we're talking about uh, imaging, we're talking about specific imaging to look at, hopefully, the regression of cancer, uh, but also the progress of the patient, how much better are they doing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we've used standardly. We've, again, really had to be very formal and methodical about this so that we can compare apples to apples and, and not just say, oh, I had this treatment and I wrote this study and it's so much better and everybody should do it. It's not really how it works. We really need to have a way we can all speak the same language. Uh, especially now that we're so global in our oncology research. So the RESIST criteria, it sounds really boring, but it's actually worth mentioning that we have a very, very specific way that we measure cancer. And again, it's, this is what we do all the time. When we see a patient and they're not on a research trial, the way we know you're doing better isn't just because some radiologist says so. It's because the, the current treatment you're getting, someone else before you has volunteered, has stepped up, and we use this resist criteria on them too. This has been around since the 1970s. So often studies will require something called a measurable tumor lesion. That means something you have to be able to see on a scan and measure. 
that can be difficult in breast cancer. And if you really get into the details of breast cancer research, um, you know many, many of our trials have to include a non-measurable disease as well, which I'll talk about, because a lot of advanced breast cancer doesn't show up in places that you can measure. So this means you must be able to accurately measure it in at least one dimension, so usually the longest diameter. And we really want it to be at least a centimeter on CT scan. Uh, these days, our CT scan technology is so great, we see two and three millimeter lung lesions or lung nodules, and those aren't always cancer because now we can see just if you breathe some bad air back in the Southwest 10 years ago, you have a little something in your lungs. So um, we really want to be able to see something. And, and if you think about it, if you sliced an orange right down the middle, you'd have a certain thickness, but if you sliced it a little bit on the top or a little bit on the bottom, it would actually look like it got smaller when actually it was that same orange. So we have to think about how big our slices are when we use this imaging technology and make sure it's not just by chance that those things look different. Uh, we used to have something called these calipers. I think uh, both Dr. Page and myself are too young for this. Um, when we, we used to use these little, like, th I think I might, I might have one for my EKG. I actually found it at my desk yesterday. Um, you know, it's something you would measure with a little point on one side, a little point on the other. I joke about that, but we do have tape measures and things we use to measure things that are on the skin or something you can feel. You don't have to do a CT scan for anything, everything. You know, you can evaluate cancer by looking at um, something on a clinical exam and seeing if it actually physically gets smaller and bigger. Um, that could be nice for the patient and the, and the uh, clinician because it's something you can actually see getting better over time. And a chest x-ray we hardly ever use now as a standard studying procedure. Sometimes it's just used more for other problem solving, but things need to be even bigger on a chest x-ray because the level of resolution is not as good. When you think about lymph nodes, what we've had trouble with lymph nodes is lymph nodes aren't perfectly round. You can't always measure them just by their longest dimension. So in fact, we've said you actually have to take their shortest dimension and it has to be bigger than a centimeter and a half because a normal lymph node can be anywhere between a centimeter and a centimeter and a half. Um, but this is just an example of how really uh, detailed we have to be and how we have to all agree on these rules in order for all of our information that we pass to each other in the medical community to be usable. So all other things that are smaller are considered non-measurable, and things we can't even really measure well are something like leptomeningeal disease. This is spread of the cancer along the lining of the brain, and it's very difficult to image and see, but a very serious. Ascites, that's fluid in your belly, or fluid around your heart or your lungs, or even inflammatory breast disease where it's just red and pink in a large uh, uh, swath of skin, um, or spread in the lungs that's not quite uh, through uh, normal channels, it's more through the lymphangetic channels. All of these are difficult and not really measurable. Uh, we want to document that they exist, but we can't necessarily use them as our primary measurement um, and other sort of masses in the abdomen that are difficult to image. So there are um, other things we have to think about. We can't just measure all the same area. Uh, you try to total a target of five, five lesions, um, but a maximum of only two per organ, so you can't pick all things out of the liver or all out of the lung. Bone lesions are considered not measurable. So again, in, in advanced breast cancer, that's a very common location, and we don't want to discount all women who that's their primary source of their cancer. So instead, we consider that non-measurable, and many, many breast cancer trials have now moved forward and said, we'll allow patients on uh, with non-measurable disease, which means essentially bone only. Sometimes when there's a part of the bone area that's growing out of the tissue, you can measure that, but that's pretty rare. Oh, I think I missed my four, whatever my four was, but that's okay. So how would you pick an area in this scan? It's going to come up. This is tough. You know, I mean, this would be a can uh, This is a liver. So this is someone laying down. Uh, their, head, their head is probably more into the screen here. Their feet are here. So this is their right side, and this is their left side, and this is all their liver, and these are all tumors. And so it can be very difficult because you want to be descriptive and you want to be methodical. So we would say, okay, we'll measure this, the largest diameter of this large one here, and we'd call that, you know, remember, maybe a caudate lobe lesion, and then we'll measure the largest diameter of this. And then what we would do is remember this was on um, image two of, uh, uh, you know, the second, the, second, the second series with the, the 24th image. We'd have a little sign up here, what we would know, and we'd have to write that down and then remember it. So it's very methodical, and it really helps us better follow the patient. So that just gives you examples of how we are doing things. Um, you might sort of think uh, when you hear about clinical studies, and certainly historically in our past, we've had a lot of bad stories about 
things that have happened to certain populations of people with clinical studies, why would I want myself or my loved one to go on a clinical study? And often, the biggest reason is they want access to a new treatment. You might come into my office and I might say, okay, based on the clinical story I hear, based on everything that has happened to you and what I know about your cancer, there's a really new exciting drug that I've heard about that we finally have a trial that's uh, offering it to patients and I think this is your way to get it. It's not an approved drug. You're not going to get it somewhere else. I've had a few patients say to me, oh, I'll just go to England and get that. And I was like, you know, they don't have it in England either. It's not approved. If it's not approved in America, chances are it's not approved in England. Um, and so it's really often to be able to get access to something that's exciting that hasn't yet been approved. And ultimately, you want a better chance of success. You know, everyone wants to do better, a better chance at cure, a better chance at keeping this cancer controlled, a better chance at feeling better, um, a better chance of having less side effects. If you think about what Dr. Dunham talked about this morning, moving from a radical mastectomy to a, a modified radical mastectomy, the goal there was to keep the same success rate but have less disfigurement and lymphedema and pain. So we, we just want better success with whatever we're doing. Um, I think, again, sort of talking about to my patients about the fact that someone else has volunteered for you, you often are wanting to help us advance our science. If, if you can't cure me, doctor, at least you can help some woman who's going to sit in your office 10 years from now. So there is an altruistic part of this. Um, ultimately, our focus is always on the person sitting in front of that, uh, us and how we can better help them, but it does help us advance science. Some studies, like Nikki mentioned, if you're just donating your tissue, you're probably not getting anything from this, but your hope is someone can learn from it. Someone can use this thing that happened to me that I didn't want happen to me for someone else's betterment. And mostly because we don't have the answers. If anyone tells you we know everything and we know exactly what to do, they're wrong. We don't have all the answers. We never have all the answers. And so when I think about clinical trials and research, it's because we have questions. I tell my kids every day, be curious. You know, think about stuff. Want to learn new things. Be creative and curious. And this is what we are as scientists. In our heart is we're curious people who want to make things better. So what should you say? I think this is probably, if you had one slide here to take home from your study, what should I ask? How should I go about this? Uh, logistical things, like how often do I have to come in? When do I have to visit the hospital? Again, that little page in the 25-page consent, that one page that has the calendar can be the most informative for you in saying, all right, the doctor said I usually have to come in every three weeks, but on the study I might have to come in a little more often. I often tell my patients that. If you're participating in a clinical trial, you often have to visit us more often and donate more tubes of blood. Um, those are kind of two universal things I think about when I think about studies. But usually that's because it's for your safety or it's for our knowledge. So it's, it's not usually just because we want to get extra co-pays or see you more often, um, although it's nice to see people like Nikki more often. She's a really nice person. So, um, However, it's usually for some methodical reason so we can capture what's going on. Um, how long will the study last? Nikki mentioned that some studies are going to want to follow you for years. So I have had patients interested in study but know they're moving to another country within a shorter period of time. It's not really ideal. I mean, there are some studies that are open globally, but um, many studies we'd, we'd like you to promise to be around. And we understand this is a global age. People move around, but often studies are open in other places. I certainly have picked up patients in my practice who've done the most important part of their study at Kaiser in San Francisco, at you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, but then I've become their follow-up physician, we too can contribute to the follow-up portion of their phase when it's a little bit easier to follow them. What are the costs? A big part of the um, informed consent is, is there anything I'm going to have to pay for? And our goal, and the reason these things are so expensive, is to have this not be the case. We really don't want you getting more of a bill for anything. But logistically, if we think something is reasonable to monitor, and it's a standard of care to monitor that, and that's something that might be billed to your insurance, you should know, is my insurance going to see a bill? Um, there are insurance companies who've not allowed patients to go on any clinical studies for this. We've really worked hard to have that not be the case. We don't want your insurance to dictate whether you can do this wonderful thing and get on a clinical study or not. But um, you know we don't control everything. So we've worked in advocacy with um, 
within the government and within healthcare and other things to have that not be the case. So it's important to ask the question, will this cost me more? Do I have to pay for anything? Some people are traveling to come to do studies. We certainly have a fair amount of people who know about the incredible research we do at Providence and come up and stay overnight. Um, so therefore, we've our foundation has been amazing and has made it so that we have guest housing. We can house people for, for free overnight if they don't have a friend or a family member they want to stay in. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a cost. So the costs sometimes seem pretty uh, specific, like, am I going to have to pay for that EKG or not? Which, again, usually the answer would be no if that's not part of your standard treatment. But the other costs are how much time am I away from my, pa my family? How much time am I away from my work? You know, how do I have to drive more and things like that? Those types of costs we can't always give back. What type of long-term follow-up care is part of this trial? Again, you know, thinking about uh, after I do this 12 weeks of treatment, is there anything else you're going to want from me? You know, oh yes, we want a survey at one year. We want you to let us know if something happens to you. Um, so, sort of knowing up front your most important asset you're giving us is your information, and so we want to be able to follow that. And if I benefit from this intervention, will I be allowed to continue receiving it? This is a very common question. Um, most often, the answer is yes, we want to continue something that's working. That's the goal. In fact, that's how we see something often as working for a long time. But if it's a short-term intervention, like, say, acupuncture for 12 weeks for aromatase inhibitor joint pain, which was a very successful study, you know, can I keep getting that acupuncture after? In that ex example, you can't buy paid for the study, but of course you can keep doing that intervention. We never want to say, um, you know, I always say to my patients, you're my patient first and I'm your doctor first. The trial will say things like, by study, you should do this, by study, but in the end, we always get to make our own decisions. We get to tell the study that we're not doing that or, or we are. Our best intentions should be to follow it. We should go into this both as, uh, assuming this is going to be the way we're going to do it, but if we decide to do something different, that's up to us as our therapeutic relationship supersedes the study relationship. And will the results of the study be provided to me? Um, many of these large phase three blinded randomized studies, the ones that have a title that's a little daunting to read, um, you may or may not know you got the study treatment for a while. You may never know. You will get the re results of the study. Often they will agree to provide the information when it gets released to everyone. It will be released to you more usually in a specific letter form. Um, I have for certain patients who have been on a blinded placebo-controlled study when they have needed to know the results sooner because some event happened to them, some problem happened to them. An example was we were giving metformin, which is a classic diabetes drug, to prevent recurrence of breast cancer. We actually still do not have the results of that study, but a patient developed diabetes and her endocrinologist needed to know if she got that drug or not. You know, so that was, I called the study, they said, oh, she wasn't getting it. And I said, well, that makes sense. <laughs> if she was getting it, maybe she wouldn't have got the diabetes. I don't know. But um, you need to know sometimes answers about your study sooner. And so that's why there are PIs and there are people and there's safety because, you know, nothing is more important than the patient's care. So the study would never say, no, I won't give that to you. You can't know. It's, I think it's important and they understand why I think it's important. We'll get that answer. So... I mentioned in the beginning, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we do this better? How do we make our percentage not 3% or 5% or even 8%, but closer to 60%? Well, you yourself can be your own advocate. You don't just have to rely on your doctor. There is this place, Nikki mentioned it, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. It's a great website. Um, it, it's pretty user-friendly. You can type in breast or advanced breast or triple negative breast. Um, you end up getting everything that's available across the United States, which is great. Uh, sometimes it's not updated or accurate, but I think the, uh, most studies really try hard to have it be pretty accurate. Um, but really, realistically, people going through cancer care are facing so many issues, as we were talking about this morning, just that initial kind of surgical decision, and we're here talking about more advanced breast cancer, although it's true about all phases, um, you, you often just need to be offered by your doctor, and that's why I think it's important to think about, does a place perform research, and do they have that capability as, as their, as their um, as your doctor. Uh, we used to think all research happened in the universities. It turns out it doesn't. I mean, I came to Providence because of its incredible research platform. And so you really can find research sources in lots of places, even remotely. 
Um, sometimes you are really in a great therapeutic relationship, a really good t uh, time with your doctor, but you want to get a second opinion somewhere to see um, if they do a lot of studies and they know something. And often I have been that second opinion and said, no, you're getting exactly the care I would offer. There's no trials that are better. I have, for my patients, looked around in, in distant places. They say, you know, my daughter lives in San Francisco. Is there something better there? And we've contacted our contacts there. Uh, so a second opinion can be helpful to either reassure that what you're getting is the right thing or that there may or may not be something for your specific time point. Of course, there are lots of websites that you can look at. We all try to keep these things as up to date as possible, but mostly also ask your doctor. I mean, never, ne it never hurts to say, is there, is there a clinical trial available to me? And, and I think that oftentimes the, the reason it's three or six percent is not because everybody's saying no, it's because we might not have something. If you think about how specific our questions are, they can't always answer every person in front of you's specific scenario. But um, if you ask your doctor, you're more likely to hear about something you didn't know about. So typically in advanced breast cancer, we have lots of different types of trials, but we often are talking about our trials in the way we have been talking about breast cancer. That is to say something that's for the estrogen or progesterone positive group of women or for the triple negative group of women or the HER2 new overexpressed group of women. So that is one way we have separated out our trials. Um, we often will require there's a specific type of treatment or perhaps lack thereof in your case. So you'll hear things like this is a first line or a second line study or it's wide open to lines of therapy. A line of therapy means like a time at which you got that treatment. So say you have a, a new diagnosis of advanced stage four breast cancer and you were treated standardly with a, a first line endocrine therapy and a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and this trial is looking at the next step after that. In that trial, that, that inclusion, exclusion, hopefully not four pages, but <laughs> maybe one or two pages will say those things. So not every trial is open for everyone. And what's difficult about that is really exciting things come up and open, and there are people out there just living their lives with these cancers, and they don't fit that criteria perfectly. So um, sometimes it's difficult difficult because you're seeing a patient who you'd really like to try to get them some new treatment and they don't fit the criteria. So we have ways of um, trying to help find other studies or in, in most desperate scenario getting compassionate use, which is to say get the drug from the company uh, through a very special program. But in general, the reason we've made it so, cr so specific like that is so that our answer can be generalizable to what we learn. The size and location of the advanced treatment, we talked a lot about that resist criteria and having measurable disease or not. Um, and uh, often they require treatment or interventions to follow the protoc protocol specific schedule. So I've talked a lot about that. So there are a wide variety of treatments being looked at. I'll, I'll give a few examples, but again, the talk wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list of what trials are out there in advanced breast cancer. I'll give a few examples that will really highlight things. But um, one particular new area in endocrine therapy and advanced uh, estrogen positive breast cancer is looking at the in inclusion of these CDK4-6 inhibitors or other new drugs to re reverse uh, resistance to estro estrogen, anti-estrogen therapy. There, of course, is a very big excitement around immunotherapy. Um, these are drugs that you might have heard about last year in the Komen talk by Dr. Page, but we've approved them in melanoma and lung cancer and bladder cancer. And, we're um, hoping to find a group of women in breast cancer that it's effective for. We now have a trial opening, like in the next few weeks, even in estrogen positive breast cancer. So that's a really exciting new um, opportunity. We've been looking in triple negative for a long time. Um, and then, of course, there are other targeted therapies. I'll often tell patients we're not really spending a lot of time developing new cytotoxic typical chemo, the stuff that just is kind of the blast and kill stuff. We're not making a lot of new of those. We're trying to be smarter about our cancer treatment. We're trying to figure out how is a cancer cell different, how can we target that, and try to have not as many other side effects but yet be very effective in how to kill cancer cells. So to the, to the great stories. So MC, MJC, is a 68-year-old Korean woman. She presented with chest pain and a left breast redness back in September of 2013. So her story will be a little long, which is nice. Um, at the time, she was due for a mammogram, um, and they did that, and she had a new mass and abnormal-looking armpit lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes. Uh, there was a biopsy of the breast, and the lymph node showed an estrogen positive or estrogen expressing her 2 new overexpressed or her 2 new positive breast cancer. She had been having a, a good amount of hip pain and this continued chest pain that, with a normal sort of cardiac workup. So they did a PET CT at that time. I actually wasn't her doctor at that time. 
and she had um, unfortunately many bones affected as well with her cancer. So she had stage four breast cancer at the same time as having the primary in place. That doesn't happen very often, but it's a, it's a, it's a percentage of our patients for sure. Of all patients with advanced breast cancer, I believe 12% have the primary tumor intact in their breast. Of all patients presenting with a breast mass, it's not even 6% of patients have advanced cancer at that time. So she started on our standard first-line care. Many women had volunteered before her to know that our standard first chemo in this scenario should be docetaxel, which I spelled wrong, um, trastuzumab or Herceptin, and pertuzumab or Perjata, a triplet therapy. It's one cytotoxic chemo and two targeted therapies. So she was going to benefit from the research that showed this was going to make her live longer to do this. She did six cycles, and then we just knocked off the, the chemotherapy part, the docetaxel part, just to keep her on the targeted therapy. Again, something that has really revolutionized our care. So she stayed on the Herceptin and the Perjata for at least a year and had significant shrinkage of the breast and lymph node areas. Um, pain had gone away. She also had a little bit of radiation treatment palliatively to help her pain in her back. So she was doing great. Um, a year later, though, however, she had these tumor markers in her blood, which aren't written generally all the time into our protocol, but again, we're able to use our standard of care ways we evaluate patients as much as we wanted. Those started to go up, so I was a little concerned. I was her doctor at this point that she might have some disease resistance or something growing somewhere. So a PET CT in December 14 showed more intense and new bone areas. So she had more spread of the cancer to newer bone areas. So she was offered the standard second line treatment, which was TDM1 or Kedsyla. Again, many women had volunteered before her to know that was the next best thing to do. It's an IV treatment every three weeks. Um, it's similar to that trastuzumab, but it's actually linked to a little chemo. But we also had a new clinical trial. We had a very new, exciting phase one study. Um, it was of an oral targeted therapy, a HER2 targeted therapy called ONT380. At the time, it had no other name. Now it is called tucatinib. Um, it was a phase one study. And phase one, not because uh, it was phase one mostly to look at the combination of the two. So we didn't mention that. Some phase ones aren't necessarily first in human, but first combination in human. So you don't always know how two things are going to mix together, and you have to be real careful with that. So this was a combination of that TDM1 plus the pill. I thought it was a win-win situation in the sense that I knew she was getting a standard good thing, and perhaps this oral pill could add benefit to it. But the whole reason for the consent and for the process of, of going through this was there could be harms from the pill, too. It could make it less effective. She could have side effects. It is no small decision tree to say, I want to go on a clinical trial but hopefully in that conversation, just like that decision tree Dr. Dunham was talking about, you find that this is the right answer for you and your family. And I will tell my patients sometimes, like, I'm sorry, I'm doing a really bad job selling this because I'm not sure this is the right thing for you. But often I will say, I really think this is a good option. This is the right option for you. The standard exists, but this is the right option for you. Um, so she did end up consenting and went on study, uh, and she initially had to have some treatments held. She had some lab abnormalities. So in the beginning, it seemed like, oh, I wonder if this is going to work out. Is she going to do okay? She had some elevation in her liver enzymes. However, um, that can happen even with the standard therapy, which in the end, I think it was from. Um, she was able to stay on study. So luckily, the study was written, and the people we worked with in the study, that we could hold treatment, we could delay treatment, we could dose reduce some things. And that was us learning. Every time we had to hold or dose reduce something, that was our uh, that was the people who were making the ONT380 in our center learning something about the drug. So everything that happens, we try to learn from. She ended up staying on the IV TDM1 and the oral ONT380 for 30 cycles, or from December 2014 to October 2016. That is far longer than she should, she would have been expected to be on the Cadsilab alone. So that was a great success. She then did have growth in new bones on her PET CT scan, but that was the longest time she's ever been on any treatment. She's now on a a different line of therapy. Um, however, she's still alive. She feels really well. She's had um, she's on the fifth line treatment. And did I did I say that she um, the drug itself now is known as tucatinib? It's in a phase three study for approval. We actually have that at Providence. Um, it's enrolling the study. That this study is a placebo controlled blinded study because now they really want to know if it's the tucatinib or not that made her do better. It could have just been by chance that was the right thing for her, but because we got so many stories like that in the phase one and phase two, it's, it's moving on to final phase. She benefited from the study, I'm sure. Um, she, like I said, she could have benefited from the, the standard agent, but she also contributed to our advancement for many, many other women, 
and she's had three grandkids since this happened. She just went to San Francisco and saw her daughter had her first baby, and her son has had another baby, and uh, it's just beautiful to see them come, as an, come in as a family and continue to do well, and the goal entirely all along is to be alive as long as possible to see these wonderful things happen in her life. I, I, I know that Nikki also enjoys knowing them, and it's, it's neat when she talked about that relationship. We often have study patients who have not been on study in years that call Nikki. You know, and she's like, well, um, I'll help you find the right person, but I'm not your nurse anymore. But she usually helps them get to the next right best place. So great note story number two. A little bit of a different story, but all going to be success stories today. Um, K.L. is a 64-year-old woman who, um, in 1992, a long time ago at age 38, I did not know her then, had a stage 2 breast cancer. In fact, I was graduating from high school. Um, she uh, had an estrogen-positive cancer. She was treated with chemotherapy then, a lumpectomy and radiation. She took five years of tamoxifen. That's what we had then. Um, many years later, in 2010, at age 57, she had a new lump near her chest bone, and the imaging and a biopsy showed it was a recurrence, unfortunately, in the bone coming out of her sternum, and it was stage four. Um, she, when they did the biopsy, uh, it was still estrogen positive and still HER2 new negative, so that was great to confirm to know the right next treatment um, thing to do. She, from April 2010 to February 2013, I, I wasn't caring for her back then either, she took the oral anti-estrogen letrozole, so that's a long time that she did that. Um, she also took the uh, anti-estrogen injection fulvestrant from Feb 13 to June 13, a shorter period of time, and when I met her, it was about at that time when uh, she had had that short period of time. And she was really having a lot of growth in this chest bone mass. It had, uh, I don't believe it had ever been irradiated, and we talked about that. Um, it's not something you could see, but it was something she could definitely feel the pain of. And uh, the reason she came to me is because her recommendation was to start oral chemotherapy because of how rapidly it was growing. And I said to her, well, I think there are chances you could still get response from a different anti-estrogen. That injection just might not have been the right move for you. It's, it's a risk, but I think you could try tamoxifen. So she started tamoxifen in late June 2013, and actually that went well. Um, in the period of time she was on the tamoxifen, we opened a very novel phase one study, novel being a, a, you know, sort of a really interesting new way of thinking about clinical studies, where we, we opened it in August of 14, so it was near over a year later. In this study, they allowed people to start uh, in the midst of their treatment. Many treatments will have you have to start a treatment right at the get-go, and this one was written in a way they wanted to see what new, it was a new oral CDK4-6 inhibitor. At the time, none of those were approved, and they were looking at different combinations. So they wanted to know what that would be like with tamoxifen. Um, it required a lot of blood draws. It had a lot of PKs. Uh, she really made a commitment to come in and do this study uh, on the first and second day. This oral CDK inhibitor at that time was called LY2835219. Um, in July, there were no other approved. So I had heard about the class of drugs. I'd seen some work by some of the other drugs. So I knew it was potentially an exciting idea. And she consented to the study and all those requirements. Um, so she added this to her tamoxifen and did really well. Her sternal bone tumor shrank. She's been stable ever since. It's been since August 2014. Um, she's cycle 46 on treatment. That's over three and a half years on study. Um, so she's not had to do any chemotherapy yet. She's been able to delay that. Uh, the drug has been approved. It's the third CDK46 approved of bemcyclib or Verzenio. And um, it's not even approved yet with tamoxifen, but that's the combo she's on. She has traveled to Hawaii more times than I can count. This woman lives a great life. Um, she also has two new grandchildren. They live in San Diego. She was just in her motor home in New Orleans. Um, they built a new house on their property. Uh, she, she lives a good life, uh, and, and it's great. She actually has had a lot of side effects from the drug. Um, she's been able to manage them. We've been able to change doses. It's not all roses and flowers, as everyone knows when you have advanced breast cancer. But again, if you can really see what the goals are here, and again, for her, her, her goals definitely were to keep living her life to its fullest, and having two pills she could take as opposed to chemo was really the right answer for her. Here were her scans. Um, this was that tumor, so uh, this was that tumor kind of growing out, and this is what it looks like more recently. You can barely kind of see it, so next July and March. So my final story, and then we'll allow some questions, is uh, EJ. This is a 71-year-old woman who has stage 3 triple negative breast cancer in 2012. She had a mastectomy chemotherapy then. 
Um, she had all the things we would want to do to keep that cancer from coming back. But unfortunately, in July 15, she had new worsening shortness of breath and anemia and was found to have a large mass in her pleura, in her lungs, sort of the lining of her lungs with fluid, a pleural effusion, as well as some bone abnormalities. She had a biopsy of that mass and was found to have, uh, again, triple negative breast cancer, her ER negative, PR negative, HER2 new negative. She saw one of my colleagues in Newburgh, Dr. Perlowitz, um, who knew we had a new study opening with immunotherapy, and really not many studies had been open at that time. She did not have it open. At the time, we, couldn't, we didn't have it open yet in Newburgh, so she sent her to see me. And um, so that, it's a bit of a drive. She had to drive farther than she normally would. Um, and she was very open-minded, and we had this new phase three study opening in that August. Uh, she was the first person I believe we enrolled. It was a randomized, it's, a, it's randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled, so she doesn't know what she's getting. I don't know what she's getting. She could be getting a placebo, uh, phase three study called Roche, W029522. Um, there was, there's a standard chemotherapy as part of it. The standard first-line chemotherapy is weekly NAB, paclitaxel, or Braxane, and then the study is with or without immunotherapy, uh, atezolizumab. Atezolizumab wasn't approved for anything, I don't believe, then. It might have been approved in lung cancer. It's since been approved in bladder cancer and a few other things. Um, she's still on study. It's uh, cycle 33 or two and a half years later, and if anybody knows anything about triple negative breast cancer, two and a half years on one treatment is really impressive. Um, I don't know what she's getting, but I kind of suspect she's getting the study drug because she's done so well. Either that or she just has really good luck with her first chemo, but she's also had a few side effects that hint to me she might be getting the study drug, but we'll continue to treat her without knowing, and she just continues to be happy to be doing well. Um, the study will actually be done soon, but she can continue on the study. She's coming in very frequently. It's, it's a quite a frequent infusion, um, but we aren't sure what she's getting. She goes to the Shakespeare Festival every year in Ashland. Um, she also has had just a wonderful quality of life despite getting ongoing chemo. Uh, it, it was worth it for her to make that decision, and we hope, in her case, she's really going to contribute to what we know about immunotherapy and breast cancer. Here are some of her scans to show this was that pleural mass which was really, and she had, I think she'd already had the fluid drained, but the fluid was here and it was kind of compressing her whole lung. Um, it's completely uh, disappeared. She has a complete response. So she's had nothing in this area from August 15th to January of 18. So that was kind of my end of my stories and trying to give you examples. Hopefully we were able to convince you today to all be advocates for clinical studies um, for friends and family. The first question is, how do you, the doctors, hear about these trials? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, you have to really have a research, research platform in place. We are really lucky that we have a great group of people who help do our research administration and make it all happen and keep it all moving in a smooth fashion. Um, but if you're a member of, say, uh, a cooperative group, one of those sort of alphabet soup ones, so we're a member of SWOG and we're a member of Alliance. I go to those meetings, I find out what the smart people in the country are talking about for breast cancer. I get really energized by hearing the thought leaders in breast cancer make up the new ideas and helping contribute to it. When they say, is this idea going to really work out? Are people going to do this? They have patient advocates who raise their hand and say, no patient's going to want to do that. Or I'll say, you know, in a community cancer center, that's going to be hard to do. It might be okay at a Sloan Kettering, but not at a community cancer center. So we go to meetings. We belong to groups. We, um, I really wanted to show a little clip. Uh, it's called GoBoldly.com. It's the pharma companies all getting together to make just small ads that show how important research in pharma is. As bad as rep they get for having expensive drugs and having guys go to jail for doing bad things, of course, these days, people are going to jail for everything. So, um, But sh they, they do a lot of money into research and development. And so sometimes we just have a relationship with a medical science liaison, a person who has a science background who works for a pharma company. And sometimes we just have brilliant people like Dr. Page or myself who will think up something and then have to work hard to talk to Komen and to talk to other funding agencies. And there's a lot of things written and done that don't end in anything. But if it ends in something, it's really important. Do patient move to other states for clinical trials? Another fabulous question. Thank you for who, who uh, submitted this. Sometimes. I mean, I think that ultimately it's tough to uproot your life for a clinical study where you might not get the thing 
the reward, the benefit you're looking for. I don't usually encourage people to really do that. I mean, if it's sort of possible and not that hard because it's Seattle and you can drive up there every three weeks, if your daughter lives there and you don't mind buying a plane ticket. I mean, I've had a patient come do a clinical trial of mine who lived in Maryland, um, but her sister lived in Lake Oswego, so she didn't mind and she, had a, she worked for, for a, a good company and she could afford a plane ticket every three weeks to come see us and, and for her, it really was the, the best answer for her, but it's really a rare case that someone's traveling from out of state. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it happens depending on how important the trial is, and it's really, that, that's an important question to go over with your, um, with your doctor if you're thinking about that. How do patients not at Providence learn about trials? Um, do Portland doctors ever refer to each other? Another great question. So I think that um, you know, asking your doctor if there are trials, looking up clinicaltrials.gov, um, getting other opinions other places, uh, looking on the cancer center's websites and seeing there usually is a link for trials. What do we have here? We try to keep those things up to date. And absolutely, P Portland doctors absolutely refer to each other. One of the things I love about this community is how close specifically our breast cancer group is. We have quarterly meetings in the evening where we all interface with each other, surgeons, med onks, rad onks from all the different institutions. I know Dr. Page in his own study has had people a lot referred from OHSU, even Kaiser where it tends to be a closed network. I've had patients come out of network for Kaiser and ways and try to be very creative about their ways to be able to be on a study, although they do have studies. All of our major centers, thankfully, have, have, have trials here. Um, but yeah, we, we, I think it's just worth being the advocate for yourself or your family and just keeping asking those questions so you make sure you get the answer you want to want to hear. In advanced cancer, isn't there a concern that the trial may backfire and now the patient has lost important time? Um, Always, it's a concern in advanced cancer. What is the right sequence of events and what's the right thing to do? Usually, we're trying to build on something we already know works. Most of my examples had a standard of care in addition to, I, I guess I didn't pick a good three examples for that reason. But what I'll often tell patients is the standard of care exists and it's not going anywhere and it's here next uh, if we need it. But right now is our opportunity to try this new thing. And what if the new thing's the next best thing? It, it may not be, we can't promise that every time. Um, I know in advanced cancer, time is probably the most important thing a patient can have sometimes, and not always, but uh, I've had patients, a really educated patient where she like had a spreadsheet and really wanted to know how to organize things. In the end, I told her, you know, let me do the homework. I'm your doctor. You look up everything you want. I will give you my best opinion. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's just, it's not the same path for every patient, of course. Um, and then how does a patient or doctor move forward? Um, you know, I think that, you know, in the end, it, it, it's, it, it seems simple when we give a talk, go on a clinical trial, but it has to be the right match for where you are at what's going on for you at that time. And sometimes it's not, and that's okay. And so uh, I've had patients who really want to help and contribute, and it's like, yeah, maybe later, this isn't the right thing for you, and that's okay, because in the end, this is your life and what you have to do for you. Oh, good. What trials are going on now for lobular breast cancer? Is this also for lobular? Is that what you said? Um, imaging and therapy. Uh, actually, quite a bit of good work going on in lobular breast cancer. Um, I don't know specifically of a good imaging study right now. I think that that continues to work. Uh, they continue to work on that in the in the in the settings of both advanced and local breast cancer. Um, Therapy-wise, there's people looking a lot at the CDH uh, mutation. A lot of our trials now are using gene mutations, so we're tumor sequencing patients. We have this great trial where you just uh, contribute some blood and a piece of your most recent tissue called the TriSeq study at Providence where we're doing full genome sequencing of the tumor and looking for targetable mutations. That means a change in your cancer that might have something we can do something about. Um, there are some pretty exciting new targeted drugs for things like that, so I don't have a great answer for that, but do we have any specific studies for lobular breast cancer? Not right now. We include lobular breast cancer with all our ductal breast cancer, so yes, in the sense that every breast cancer trial would be included, we don't have anything singling that out right now. Um, can you discuss a bit more about detection of bone mets? You, your example, you talked about CT and PET scan. Yes, of course, there are bone scans as well, so often for looking at bone metastases, um, a PET CT scan is, is attractive because it's an all-in-one study. You only have to get one test. 
Um, however, not all breast cancers show everything on PET CT scans. So the standard of care still remains a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis with a bone scan. A bone scan uses um, technetium 99 to look at uptake in the bones, and uh, it's not cancer specific. Actually, a PET CT is not cancer specific either. They're all looking at different ways of looking at cell uptake when you expect a certain amount of uptake and there's more and you suspect maybe it's cancer. So, um, you know, I think. Uh, our trials often allow us to use what we've been using. Uh, our insurers often don't, so it's usually not as much the study that requires a bone scan or a PET scan, but your insurance company and or your doctor saying, for you, the best imaging has been CT and bone scan. Often if I have someone that we've been imaging all along one way, it's nice to keep going that way. I like apples and apples when I can have apples and apples. Sure. Um, patient number one was diagnosed de novo with triple negative breast cancer. How come she... Oh, triple positive, right, breast cancer. How come she stopped her septum perjata after just one year? Um, then she had progression at, and had to get Cadsila. She actually stayed on the Herceptin perjata and prog until she progressed. Um, we actually have had also tried estrogen therapy with Herceptin on her, and it's not been effective. So while it's estrogen positive by uh, her biopsy, it's not been a, an effective way to treat her. So we've had to stick with more chemo and targeted therapy in her case. So she stayed on the targeted therapy and stopped the uh, docetaxel part because it was too toxic to do for more than the six cycles for her. Okay, I think we're wrapping up pretty soon, but if you're on placebo stage, I will always be on placebo. What is that? Okay. We don't placebo it. So. Okay. So it, we typically don't see placebos in a study until later phases of trials. It, we wouldn't be ever placeboed in a phase one trial. Hopefully that helps answer yes. that. Uh, those are the simulcast. On average, how long after a clinical trial is completed will a drug be approved? Oh, years. That's a great question. Um, it often takes many years. Um, these days, the FDA has some accelerated approval mechanisms, so not, sometimes it's not that many years, but you know, the ONT380 will probably be approved in two or three years, and we started the trial with it uh, in 2014, and they were doing trials before us in 2012. It's probably a good 10 years, if not longer. Do they ever do clinical trials on non-chemical drugs? Absolutely. We talked a lot about therapeutic trials with, um, with, with drugs, but there are other non-chemical or drug therapies like the best surgery to do, how to add radiation if possible, does acupuncture help? Um, there's lots of things that are non-drug uh, related. These are from Providence Medford. Thanks for sending us a message remotely. So I think we'll probably have to stop now, but we'll be available up here for questions. Um, Thanks for thinking about clinical trials, talking to about everyone you know, wearing a button that says, I support clinical studies, whatever. Put it up on a, on a sky rise, on a, bring it to your poster to the Blazer game. They're 11 in a row, so go Blazers. <laughs>